the vehicle that I was in actually ended up stuck in a ditch. And so we had to dismount the vehicle while we had a tracked vehicle come up behind and, and attempt to pull it out of the, the mud. But it, it had to have been about a five minute period or so where we found ourselves uh, under fire from the enemy. There was no cover except what was partial cover behind the Humvee that I just dismounted from. But my commander and my first sergeant were against a wall across the street and they had no cover. When I looked over, I saw the two of them injured. And the point where I ran from cover out into the open, from that point on, I don't remember much other than just returning fire as I was trying to do first aid. So I was initially hit, I believe, in my leg and in my left hand. Even though I was hit, I knew that because we hadn't been medevaced yet, that we were still under fire, that uh, our, our men were still in contact with the enemy. So I knew that it was a serious situation. That's when the training kicked in to not be as concerned about myself. And if that meant that I died that day, I was ready to do that. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. So I was born in NAS Jacksonville, Florida. My dad spent a career in the Navy, so spent my whole life moving around the country and overseas. And then I just continued that trend uh, in the Army. So why the Army when your dad was a Navy man? That's a good question. So my dad uh, didn't go to a service academy, so he wasn't tied to me going to a specific uh, academy, but he was real happy when I made the decision to go to West Point and, and totally backed me with that. And then he started a route for Army over Navy at the games. So that was a big transition for him, but um, he's really been proud of me and that I continue the military service. Uh, why West Point? What was it about the Army that, and, and West Point in particular that appealed to you? I think it was just continuing the, the trend that my dad and uh, my grandfather had of serving in the military and wanting to contribute however I could. And so the Army interested me just because of just a different experience from what I was used to and stepping out of my comfort zone. And uh, I remember I applied to the Naval Academy and I actually wasn't, uh, wasn't even given the chance to submit an application. So I applied to West Point, I applied for ROTC, and I actually had received a Marine Corps ROTC scholarship and an appointment to West Point. Uh, but each step of the way I had to fight to get my foot in the door. I remember to get the congressional nomination for West Point, uh, I had to compete very uh, hard to get that. And so I actually ended up being the number one pick for the congressman, which really helped for me to receive an appointment to West Point. And so that's sort of the progression of how I came to, to receive the appointment. So West Point was a really interesting experience because for me, I needed the discipline to be instilled in me, to get up early, to go to class, to study. For a lot of people going through ROTC or like my dad with aviation, aviation officer candidate school, where they already have the discipline to go to class and not to have the pressure on them like I did, that's great for a lot of people, but for me, I needed that early wake-up call in the morning and to be told where to go, and so it really helped structure my life and keep things regimented, but also instill in me just the need for discipline and to understand what I was getting myself into and the seriousness of being in the military and the responsibility of leadership. What year did you enter West Point? I entered in 2001, right before 9-11, and I remember I was in chemistry class when that happened. And for me, once I was enrolled in West Point, that's when it really sunk in, just the gravity of what I was getting myself involved in, knowing that when I graduated, I would go to war and be away from my family. Um, but uh, that, uh, that experience of going through 9-11 and already being at the academy, for me, was really just telling of the nature of the business of the military and how real it went from us being at peace to all of a sudden being in a state of war. Uh, and so that for me was a critical turning point. When I was graduating from West Point, I'd already heard of many graduates from previous classes that had been killed in action. So carrying that weight of responsibility on my shoulders, knowing that people who came before me, some of them didn't come home. For me, uh, it, was, it was pretty hard to just understand that that could easily happen to me once I was deployed. And it wasn't long after uh, graduating from West Point that I found myself downrange. It was about six months after I graduated. I had just finished artillery school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and I was over in Germany. And I spent about two weeks during the winter in January training for desert operations in the Middle East, doing uh, infantry type maneuvers and all that to prepare for just different experiences I might come across in Iraq. And I actually met my guys when I was in Kuwait 
just prior to going into theater in Iraq. And so it was very fast and furious. And before I knew it, I was on the ground in Iraq on a convoy going to our, our large camp right off the Euphrates River. And I didn't really know what was going on at first. And I was a brand new second lieutenant thrown into combat. And uh, I just wanted to make sure I didn't let anybody down. And it was a very quick learning process for me of just knowing being in combat, not being able to uh, afford to make mistakes. And uh, it was a very, very quick uh, learning curve I had to have. How intense was the fighting at that point? Because 2006 was not a good year in this war. So initially in 2006, it, it was a gradual progression of increasing violence. The closer we got to Ramadan, we started to experience more attacks, more roadside bombs. But for the first four months or so, it was relatively quiet and we just had periodic skirmishes with the enemy. And it wasn't until closer to Ramadan that we started to get hit every day. We would wake up to the sound of gunfire pinging off our buildings in our Ford operating bases that we lived at. And so a lot of days it was sort of a restless mentality that people had of waking up and knowing they'd have to go out on patrols and having to watch your 360 degree perimeter all around you everywhere you went, going to the bathroom, leaving the building, coming into and out of the Ford operating base. It was a very stressful environment. It was immediately following Ramadan that I was injured. We were on a mission to go pick up a couple um, bad guys and we had just found out that day that we were going to be extended by two months in our tour from 12 to 14 months. And so it wasn't a typical situation to be with both the company commander and the senior NCO, the first sergeant for our company. But all of us were in the same vehicle traveling over there to help support uh, that detainment of the two individuals. And it was during that time as we were leaving that we found ourselves in a bad situation. The vehicle that I was in actually ended up stuck in a ditch. And so we had to dismount the vehicle while we had a tracked vehicle come up behind and, and attempt to pull it out of the, the mud. But it, it had to have been about a five minute period or so where we found ourselves uh, under fire from the enemy. And so it, it seems like a very quick time and it could have been longer that we were sitting there exposed out in the open. But being dismounted from our vehicle left us exposed. There was no cover except what was partial cover behind the Humvee that I just dismounted from but my commander and my first sergeant were against a wall across the street and they had no cover. So to be honest, a lot of it I don't remember because it happened so quickly, but I do remember initially as we received machine gun fire that when I looked over, I saw the two of them injured, Captain Stainbroke, our company commander, and first sergeant Sapp, our senior NCO for the company. And the point where I ran from cover out into the open, from that point on, I don't remember much other than just returning fire as I was trying to do first aid to First Sergeant Sapp and then falling uh, unconscious briefly myself. And then when I came to, just yelling at our soldiers to come over and help evacuate those two other soldiers. So it is kind of spotty what I recall from that experience. I think I blacked out briefly, uh, but then I do remember at the very end of it as we carried uh, the two of them away to the vehicles. So I was initially hit, I believe, in my leg and in my left hand. Some people call it the Forrest Gump injury, that perhaps I was shot from behind. But uh, it may have been uh, one or two bullets that had struck me. And uh, even though I was hit, I knew that because we hadn't been medevaced yet, that we were still under fire, that uh, our, our men were still in contact with the enemy. So I knew that it was a serious situation, and I wasn't sure if we were going to make it out. So it was during the firefight that I had to really just kind of dig deep inside myself and think how I was going to get through that and then just contemplate very quickly that if I didn't make it out, just to be at peace with things. And so that's when the training kicked in to not be as concerned about myself, but to think about what I could continue to do and fight and not give up. And so it was that determination to make sure that I could do everything I could with every ounce of strength. And if that meant that I died that day, I was ready to do that. That training, is it character instilled in general at West Point? Is it your upbringing? What, what did you draw on for that? I think it's a combination of all three of those things. My upbringing and just being instilled in me that desire to serve your country, to constantly go as far as you can push your body and then try to go even farther than that and rely on your faith and your conviction to serve other people. And that's what I draw from on a lot of my experience of being in the military and never satisfying for the status quo or being complacent and always wondering what I could do to do more for my soldiers. How close 
were these people who were shooting at you? I'm not sure exactly how close we were. I know that there were multiple shooters with either PKM or PKC machine guns shooting at us from different locations. I believe they were within a quarter mile of where we were at. So they had um, both of them shooting at the same time and they were very close. So I think that's probably a, a great reason why they probably were able to hit. Um, actually, there were four of us that were hit and be effective in that. Did you see them? Were you able to see them when you were firing back? I did not see them. I believe the way that I was hit, I had my back turned to the shooter that actually did hit me. Um, and the reason I had my back turned to them is as I was administering first aid, I wasn't looking north down the road. I was looking south because that was the direction that First Sergeant Sapp was laying. And so while I was administering first aid, the other soldiers that had security set up from the vehicles were returning fire in those different directions. So who did you attend to? So I initially attended to First Sergeant Sapp when he was injured and I pulled out my first aid kit to administer first aid to him. And when I wasn't attempting to do first aid, I was returning fire to the enemy. And once I found myself injured, it was actually too difficult for me to reload my weapon just due to the blood loss and uh, loss of strength. I did, however, uh, find myself able to stand up, help carry him to the vehicle, and I didn't receive first aid until we were back at the field hospital, probably 10 or 15 minutes later. And it was at that point when we arrived at the field hospital that I didn't have the strength to stand up and I had to be carried into the hospital. I'm told that I was hit a third time as I carried Sergeant Sapp into the vehicle. And I remember the medic looking over at me specifically and asking me if I was injured and it was really loud because the vehicle was moving. But I just remember putting my hand in front of my face and waving at him to not worry about me. And I pointed down at First Sergeant Sapp and just yelled at him to focus on him. And it was through that nonverbal communication, even though the medic couldn't hear what I was saying, he knew exactly what I meant and he cared for First Sergeant Sapp. And I think that's in part what helped him survive that day, was focusing on the person that was more gravely injured and attending to him first. So how ultimately did they understand how much attention you needed? That's an interesting question. So I don't think initially they even realized that I was injured because as I was laying there yelling at them, yelling expletives, using the Lord's name in vain, which I definitely regret doing that, um, I don't think they realized that I was hit because as they were carrying First Sergeant Sapp, they yelled at me to help carry him. And I just remember as I was standing up, I just felt like I had this anvil holding my leg down because you have to remember I had been shot in my leg already, but I knew that if I had required to be carried out, that could have caused more injuries as well. So I did what I could and I stood up and I walked. It had to have been 50 yards, maybe, maybe up to 100, uh, to the vehicle helping carry Sergeant Sapp. And it really wasn't until we were back at the field hospital that I think everyone realized that I had also been injured. At that point, only the medic had known that I had been injured because he was looking at my wounds and saw that I had blood on my leg and all over my, my body. Um, but those at the field hospital did not know until I said something. So it's only because you rode with him exactly. that you got that attention. And so what kind of medical attention was required for you then? So I believe the initial thing that they did was they just treated me with bandages, wrapped up the wounds on my leg and in my hand. And I just recall that they had uh, given us medicine, I, I believe it was morphine, just to uh, numb the pain. Um, but one of the, the most memorable experiences for me was when Colonel Graves came in the field hospital and he was the infantry battalion commander and he looked at me and he didn't know what to say but I had asked him how First Sergeant Sapp and Captain Stainbrook were doing because I was still concerned about them and what would happen to them and I remember he told me later on that that was something that really moved him was just that camaraderie and care for each other that we had even as we were lying there possibly uh, and could have died that uh, our, our first concern was for our fellow comrades. How did they end up faring? They both survived and um, so it, it, was, it was very fortunate. There was a, a fourth soldier that was also injured, Lieutenant DM Vo, but uh, all four of us survived that day and are very, very fortunate to still be here. So once they basically stabilized you by wrapping up the wounds, what came next for you? So the next thing after I'd received the initial bandages in the field hospital was I was medevaced uh, from a helicopter and I just remember just the sigh of relief that um, I was being cared for and for me that the war was over. And I also wondered about the fate of the soldiers that I was with and, and wanting to stay with them while at the same time feeling that relief that for me 
I was able to rest and just focus on getting better myself. And so I spent one night in Balad Air Base before I was medevaced back to Landstuhl, Germany. And I spent a week in Germany and then I came back uh, and was flown to Walter Reed where I spent the next year recovering and staying with my parents while I was going to appointments and doing different surgeries. Where were you hit and what kind of damage was done? So I was initially hit in my left thigh and in my left hand and I believe the, the second or third time that I was hit, I was hit again in my leg. And so the, the damage in my leg was able to heal, heal very quickly after a few months, but it was after undergoing more surgeries in my hand uh, that required more time for orthopedic therapy and uh, a much more recovery time. How many surgeries? I'm told that it was about a dozen surgeries. The first few of those was just to keep the wounds clean. And it wasn't until I returned back from Germany that I started to receive the surgeries that actually helped regain movement in my hand and that uh, ultimately helped me to heal up. Do you still have issues that make you think about it or are you back pretty much back to the point now where you don't think about it that much? I, I do think about it sometimes. I, I'm very fortunate not to have to worry about having nightmares or uh, recollections of the experience, but there are moments where there's things that remind me of the combat. It's, it could be a scream or it could be um, just when I see people suffering and just feeling compassion for that. And so it is hard for me to, to think of young soldiers going off and fighting, knowing that uh, what they're getting into is something very serious and some of them may not come back, but just the gravity of that conviction they have and, and realizing that they are serving something greater than themselves. And so I still honor that today, that desire to serve your country and give back. I can see, obviously, you've been awarded the Purple Heart and you have another very distinguished award there too. Tell me about that. So the Distinguished Service Cross and the Purple Heart are two awards that um, for me just represent the service of so many different soldiers and I feel this deep sense of honor to be in the company of such fine people who have done as much as they could for their country and so I wear them to just exemplify all that sacrifice and all that service that you hear about every day with soldiers and so I'm very proud to represent other veterans and to be an advocate for them as well.